Hey, we're looking at um, sigma notation, finding area under a curve using rectangles. This corresponds to section 5.2 in our textbook. And I just want to warn you, for this section, like, buckle up. There's a lot going on. Uh, just to be completely transparent, I have notes right here that I'm going to be looking at. Just there's a lot going on in this section. I want to make sure I uh, convey it correctly. So I have notes I'm looking at just to make sure I do the right thing, okay? Now, you've seen the basics of this before with sigma notation. So sigma, the uppercase sigma, right here, going from 1 to n. So whatever n is, your lower bound, your upper bound, your index, i in this case. <coughs> i is just which one you are looking at, which term. So the first term, the second term, the third term, the nth term, up to n. <coughs> So then the sigma, your summation, your adding, so just adding every single term, all the way from your first term to your nth term. And it will be a little um, case by case. When I say first term, that could mean i is 1. The first term, which is the first i you come across. I could be 1 or I could be 5, in which case 5 is your first term, okay? <clears throat> so if I were taking basic summations, it's really pretty basic. You've seen this before where, okay, from 1 to 6 of I. So this simply is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, plus 6. Pretty easy summation to add up. Pretty easy formula or definition. Add it all up, you get 21. Over in example B, we have J squared. So J, the first term, is when J is 3. So 3 squared, just that's the rule you're going to apply. And you're going to go all the way to the 12th term. Add that all up, you get 645. So the summation of j squared from j equals 3 through 12 is 635. Now, I have some summation properties. They're pretty similar to the limit properties or derivative properties we looked at. When you have summation, you have a k constant inside the summation. k can be pulled out, factored out, because k is a part of your term. So you can factor it out, and then after you do it the summation, distribute the k over k. If you're summing, two terms add together, you can do sums of the individual terms. And same with subtraction. And then we get summation formulas. So one of these, uh, number two, the kind of a famous story about Carl Frederick Gauss. I guess he was like five or so in his school. And back then, school was not something everyone could afford. So he was already pretty smart, pretty well to do. And I guess that the story goes, the teacher was trying to get rid of him for a bit. He said, go add the first hundred numbers together. That did take a while. And Gauss came back very quickly and said, here it is. And the teacher said, how did you do that? I think I could be wrong, I'm going to say it, put it on a video. I think it was 5,050. We'll see if I'm right when you check me on that. The teacher, how did you do this so quickly? 
And Gauss says, well, it's just the hundredth, so 100 plus 101 divided out by 2. There you go. Much smarter guy than I am. <laughs> so we can use some of these summation of formulas to more easily evaluate the summation in example 2. So coming down here, because the properties for summations, we can split this up. So the sum from i equals 1 to 25 of just our first term, i squared, minus the sum from the first term to the 25th of just i, and then add on the third sum of just the number 1. <coughs> So kind of looking at our formulas there also as you do this, of i squared, <coughs> that would be, so i squared is this formula right here. So n is going to be 25. So we'll do 25 and 25 plus 1 times 2 times 25 plus 1 all over 6. So that's my first one. The second summation, 1 through 25 of i, use the second formula. So subtract 25, 25 plus 1, all over 2. So that's our second one. Our third one, adding it on, will just be the original summation, for, or the first summation formula. So 1, going to add that up 25 times, so 1 times 25. Have a third summation right there. Add that all up to 5,225. Just doing the arithmetic of that. So sums, how you do with them, summation formulas, how you could use them to evaluate more difficult sums. Example three, kind of take a look at that. Check my complete notes or pause the video, look there. Using sigma notation to rewrite each of the following. Kind of from one to the next, what's the same? Kind of count that into your summation sigma notation. What's different? That'll be your i. Okay? Now, going on to upper lower sums. So, this idea of the method of exhaustion. So if you want to find the area of the circle, but you don't know the formula for the area of the circle, you could inscribe a square in the circle, then find the area of that square. And that's okay. You know, it's not an overestimate if you're under. You could take the square turn it into an octagon. Find the area of that. Now you're still under, but you see the gaps around the edges. Oh my, can I go smaller? I can't, so go this route. The gaps around the edges, they're smaller than in the other circle with the square. So method of exhaustion, you could take the acting on, inscribe a decagon, or a 20 gun, or a 30 gun, or a 100 gun, and you could keep getting a better and a better estimate, okay? 
Now this idea <clears throat> can be kind of applied with error under a curve. So right side endpoints, left side endpoints. So you have a curve. We're going from zero to two on the curve. We're going to use five sub intervals. So from zero to two, let me get in here. Zero to two. Good news, five sub intervals. So two fifths, four fifths, six fifths. 8 fifths, and then the 2 is 10 fifths, 10 fifths, 2. So you have our two subintervals. <coughs> and we can use the subintervals, the 2 fifths, 4 fifths, to draw rectangles. Now, rectangles have a base, so each base is 2 fifths, 0 to 2 fifths, 2 fifths to 4 fifths, 4 fifths to 6 fifths, so on. Rectangle is base, then also height. So you think, how high does this rectangle need to be? And we're going to determine the height based upon the right side of our interval. So the first interval is this one right here. 0 to 2 fifths. This is the first interval, our first rectangle. The height of the rectangle will be from the right side of the interval, so the two fifths, up to the curve. So two fifths up to the curve. And then over. <coughs> and then cut and then that area. We'll calculate that as an estimate for the area under the curve. For the next rectangle, the next rectangle at interval 2 fifths through 4 fifths, we'll use the right side of the interval up to the curve. So from 4 fifths up to the curve. Then we'll find the area of that rectangle and add it onto the first one. And keep doing this process. So the six fifths up and over. And we're going to find that area. The eight fifths up and over. Find that area and the two up and over. <coughs> now that is one way to find area using the right side, so the right side of every rectangle up to the curve over to the y axis find the area. Now that gives us an underestimate. In this case, the function is decreasing, can't give up, so it's an underestimate. Don't want to draw these numbers again, so copy down here. Now let's do this again with left side endpoints. So our first interval, the 0 to 2 fifths, we'll use the left side of that interval to go up to the curve. Then drop the right side, same height. 
Oops, I can miss that. There, I'm a little over. Can I bring that back? Oops, I um, made the worst. That happened. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> so this is left side, and then find that area. And then do that again with the two fifths to the four fifths. So to come up, I can kind of go right to the point where the first rectangle, the right side, meets the curve. Kind of extend that over. Then find that area. Add it on to the first one. Now the air with the third interval. Extend over from the curve and up. That bothers me. That's worse. Boy, I just really made a mess of that. Sure, why not? Okay. And then color that in, add that error to the first two. And just continue this process. So over and down, over and down. And find those areas and add them up. Now look here. You see the right side is underestimate, the left side overestimate. It'd be so nice if we have like mama bear, papa bear, be nice to find baby bear right in the middle. Just a perfect estimate. Now a perfect estimate is actual, okay? So the idea is can we get a better estimate using the method of exhaustion? Instead of five rectangles, could we use 10? Or maybe 20? Or 30 or 40? And keep increasing the number of rectangles we have. Now remember, with the derivatives, the first wall of the house of calculus, that was built upon the idea of limits. So the limit as that dot x gets smaller, smaller, smaller. As the secant line approaches the tangent line. So as delta x gets smaller, smaller, remember slope, changing y, we're changing x. As changing x gets smaller, smaller, the points get closer, closer together. The secant line is the better and better estimate of the tangent line. So delta x getting infinitely small, approaching zero. Well, go on the reverse of this idea. We don't want the number of rectangles to get smaller. We don't want the, like two rectangles and one. We want a hundred rectangles or a thousand rectangles or an infinite amount of rectangles. Now, each rectangle will get infinitely narrow, but the number of rectangles will get infinitely large. So limit as n approaches infinity, an infinite number of rectangles. That'll give us a pretty perfect estimate, or an actual. Now, this is where things kind of take off, okay? So maybe you pause the video, get to drink of water, do some new jacks, go run around the house, do what you need to, because now we're really going to take off, okay? We did the limit definition of derivative. Now let's look at the limit definition of an integral. We did limit definition of rate of change. Now, limit definition of accumulation, adding infinitely many things up. 
And when they add infinitely many things up, we're going to get a finite answer. That's kind of weird. Adding up infinitely many things, but getting a finite answer. Let's see how that looks. So, this example. Find the area for the region bounded by the graph of x squared and the x-axis between 0 and 2 using the limit process. So what we're going to do is we're going to use infinitely many rectangles. And the width of each rectangle, remember, to find the area, you need width times height. We have height, x squared, we need width. Our width <coughs> or delta x, okay, that's going to be our interval width, so 2 minus 0, b minus a over n. How many times are we going to divide this interval up like? On the last page, we went to five sub intervals, so we divided by five, got two fifths of a width. Now we want n infinitely many. Well, n is getting infinitely large, two over infinity would be a limit width of zero. So we have a width of two over n. That's the width of every rectangle. So now to find error, you need a width and a height. So we have width, we now we need height, and we're going to do both endpoints, okay? Right side endpoints and left side endpoints. So we're going to start with the right endpoints. Whenever I lean over to right, I feel like I'm not in the camera anymore. So I'm moving over. Hopefully, this will be better. So the right hand boards. Now our height for the I rectangle. Remember, I is which one you're finding. So the first, the second, the third, the infinitely many. So the height is x squared, right? Now, depending on where you are, x squared is different. If you're at the origin, x squared is 0. If you're at half, x squared is 1 fourth. If you're at 1, x squared is 1. So our rectangles are going to start at 0. But then we'll be at the ith rectangle of our interval to n, to over n. So for the first rectangle, i is 1, we've done 1, 2 over n widths. If for the second rectangle, i is 2, we've done 2 over 2 over n widths. So we've gone 2 over. If i is 3, we're doing 3 of the 2 over n widths. If I is infinity, okay, infinity times 2 over infinity, the infinities cancel out, we're at 2, we're at the end of our interval. And our width, we found that is delta x, which is 2 over n, all right? So now, our summation of n rectangles, so infinitely many, and I want to move this down just a skosh, okay. It's going to be sigma from i equals 1, so the first rectangle, the first interval, up to n of delta x times h sub i. 
Remember, delta x is the width, h sub i is the height. <coughs> to find area of rectangle width times height. So I keep looking at my nose that there's a lot going on. So just stay with me, okay? So sigma from the first one to the end of our width delta x, which is 2 over n, times our height, f of 0 plus i, 2 over n. So we're going to sigma, we're going to sum up all the width the widths times the highs. The widths times the highs. We're going to add all those up. So that is sigma. I equals 1 to n of 2 over n. Now, f, our function notation is x squared. So f of this, 0 plus 1 to n squared. Our function rule is to square what do you have. So, 2 over n i squared. Instead of writing f, we'll say squared. We don't need the 0, so 2 over n i. So, let's go ahead, do that squaring, kind of simplify down. So, sigma from i equals 1 to n, 2 over n. And 2 over n, i squared. So 2 over n squared times i squared. So 4 over n squared and i squared. Let's keep simplifying this down. So 2 over n, 4 over n squared. Those are considered constants. So from the sigma summation properties, we get factor all of those. Oh, well, that sigma looks terrible. Wow. Try it again, Mr. Bay. Okay, that's better. Still getting used to writing with the stylus, so eh? Not a fan. So we have now the sigma from 1 to n of i squared. Now, i squared, we have a formula for the sigma. So 8 over n cubed times our formula for i squared. That's our formula for i squared is n, n plus 1. 2n plus 1, all over 6. And you can simplify some of this down, so 8 over 6 should be 4 over 3, n cubed and n, n goes away, n cubed becomes n squared. <coughs> So we have 4 over n squared. And then the parentheses go ahead and foil. 2 plus n, 2n plus 1. So distribute all that to n squared. Plus 3n plus 1 over 3. <coughs> and now... We have a simplified expression with n's in it. Now is the time to do our limit. 
Remember, we're doing a limit definition. We want n, the number n, the number of rectangles to approach infinity. So n is approaching infinity of 8n squared plus 12n plus 4 all over 3n squared. And hey, remember limits at infinity? Just do what's significant. The plus 4 doesn't really matter. The 12n compared to 8n squared doesn't really matter. So you have 8n squared over 3n squared. And the area under the curve, the actual area, is 8 thirds. You may think that's underwhelming, but hey, we took a limited process of infinitely many items, added them all up, got a finite enter. I think that's pretty cool. So we got a third for the right endpoint. Now you see my work, it's like I only used half of the space. Because... I can hear you groaning as you watch it. It's like, oh man. Because we did the right endpoint. Now we got to do the left endpoint. I told you about Gollum. <laughs> so, width times height. Now, height, h sub i. It's going to be our function starting at zero. But now we're doing the left endpoint. So we go to the right of the interval and then go back. So i minus one of two over n. Left endpoint, like. You take one step forward, but then one step back. One step to the right, one step left. So go to the right of the interval, but you're doing left endpoints. So go back to the left. That's why it's i minus one. So the left endpoint, first rectangle, is still at zero. Because you go to the right of the first interval, and then go back. Your back is zero. From two over n, you went to two over n, then you go back to zero. Luckily, the width hasn't changed. That's still dot x or two over n. So we'll do a summation. Sigma i equals one up to n dot x times a sub i. Again, this is just width times height. Height. Width times height. <laughs> so you have the sigma from i equals 1 up to n of width to n. Height f of 2 over n times i minus 1. Okay. <laughs> Being sure I get the right number of parentheses, had the little blank there. Let's go ahead and start working with this. So, sigma i equals 1 to n of 2 over n. Instead of the f, let's write it as the rule, the squared. 
So I meant 1, 2 over n, 2 over n, I meant 1 squared. So sigma from 1 to infinity, to kind of keep writing all that. 2 over n, I meant 1 squared. So the 2 over n squared would be 4 over n squared. I minus 1 squared, I squared minus 2i plus 1. Kind of put the brackets back in to say, hey, this is still width times height. The 2 over n, the 4 over n squared, just like in the previous example, you can factor those out. And I'm going to leave you to go from here to figure the rest of this out. But look on the start of the section, the sigma i squared minus 2i plus 1. There's three terms. Break it up into three summation formulas. And then calculate the answer. Break it up, do the limit. Formula, simplify, then do the limit process, and I think your answer it will be pleasantly surprised. So look at that, check my completed notes online, see who it did.